Good evening, everybody. Here today we've got Sam Wilson from Airbus, who's spent the last six years working in the research and development portfolio for spacecraft propulsion. Sam studied at the University of Bath, where he obtained an MSI in natural sciences, mainly in the physical and physics and chemistry streams. And from there, he's had a successful career working in Airbus, working as a teacher in a remote village in Guyana, also doing just a lot of work in this field of chemistry, but doing something that we find really, really important. Because that's quite different from what we've been taught here at UCL. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our sponsors, the SCI group, who helped organize and fund this event today, and a big round of applause for Sam, please. Thank you. That's a uh, yeah, very nice introduction. Um, I just check you guys at the back. You can hear me out all okay. Yeah. If anything on the screen is too small, if I'm blocking, just let me know because I, I end up walking around quite a lot. Um, so yes, um today I wanted to talk about three things. Uh because I'm a bit egotistical myself first. Um I heard you know quite a few of you guys as students making your way into Korea, so I thought it might be useful to share. Uh, a little bit about my timeline from school into into work sort of things i did and, and some reflections on that uh, a little bit about the company i work for which is airbus uh, and then hopefully if i don't blabber on too long i can talk about for about half an hour or so on uh, my job some of the emerging challenges uh, and try and link it back to to chemistry just to give you guys a flavor um, of how this this sort of career could be something that you you guys do in the future um, I think there's time for questions at the end, so please uh, yeah, think of a few uh, to fill the time so I don't feel like I've, I've not done a good talk. <laughs> so, uh, my journey. I, uh, I finished my A-levels in 2010, did chemistry, physics, maths, uh, maths uh, before going to spend a year, as you very kindly mentioned, uh, in British Guyana which is, if you don't know, the northern, northern tip of South America. Uh, and I spent about 18 months teaching um, maths, science and geography in, in a very remote village. So from finishing school through to, to, to university. Uh, and I, I think the first point of reflection is that for me, this was a really big step because I've spent a lot of time sheltered in school and spending a year without running water and electricity uh, in, in a village very different from uh, from Surrey Hills, uh, yeah, was it was a big shock, and I learned a lot. So I think um, you'll see it. It gave me sort of a bug for travel, understanding new cultures, and being curious, which I think is a really important thing in in science in general. So I joined the University of Bath in 2011 to do uh, natural sciences uh, NSI course with an integrated masters. Uh, and if I'm honest, the reason I chose Bath was because they're a very good sports uni. And I love my hockey and cricket and I really wanted to uh, yeah, benefit from that but uh, lucky enough my A-levels went well enough to to get into the natural sciences course. Uh, I'm not sure if, if uh, UCL has is a natural sciences. Yeah. Okay so you're familiar with you can pick subjects across the, the natural sciences and blend them together. Uh, in my case I did uh, physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, physics uh, as my sort of two main subjects as part of that. 
and I carry that on through the, through the years. Uh, as part of the degree, I did uh, what's called an industrial replacement year. And I don't know, again, if that's something that you guys have as an option, but for me, this was my first chance to really understand what work was about. Um, I was doing quite a lot of renewable energy uh, studies in, in my chemistry degree at the time, and I was very interested in nuclear power. Uh, and Rolls-Royce were offering the opportunity to uh, work as a nuclear engineer. Uh, thinking I was going to be working on, uh, you might have seen in the news, these small breeder reactors. Um, there was no business when I arrived and ended up working on nuclear submarines. Uh, so the idea was to do thermofluid uh, modelling to understand how, how the nuclear reactors work on, on those submarines. Uh, but what I thought was really good is it was the first opportunity to see actually uh, do I like uh, defence type work? Do I like uh, working in, a, in you know, a place where there's sort of a bit of a monoculture? Um, or do I want to have opportunities to work abroad and move around? Uh, all of these things I'd really encourage you all, if you're in your degree at the moment, to try and get those work experiences. Because it's as much saying what you don't like, knowing what you don't like, as, as to know what you do. Uh, so a, a really important uh, point for me. <laughs> Uh, next, I returned back to the University of Bath to complete my integrated master's. Uh, I focused a bit more on physics in that final year, but kept on with the physical chemistry, um, learning quite a lot about fluid dynamics and um, yeah, sort of thermodynamics as a topic was, was one of the areas I specialised quite a lot in. Uh, and then after, after university, I don't think I was quite ready to go into full-time work. I took another a year off after. Um, I did, a, did an internship at a small engineering company uh, for a few months. Uh, I then got a job as a safari guide in East Africa, in Kenya, where I worked for about six months um, trying to lead or learn how to lead groups of tourists around um, Masai Mara and Meru in Kenya. Uh, and that taught me really a lot about uh, how to interact with people, um, what you know, customers value, I guess, uh, in a very high-end industry where you have to, to meet all their needs. So a, an interesting experience for me. Um, and then afterwards, me and my, my girlfriend at the time, now, now my wife, uh, we spent uh, the remaining six months traveling on a motorbike together from Colombia down to Argentina. Uh, so again, an opportunity to go out and explore, uh, find out more about the world. And, and it's really sort of stoked that curiosity on you know, how people live in different cultures um, and trying to understand that's no different to the curiosity I think a lot of you guys might have with uh, chemistry and science where you're really trying to break it down and understand what, you know, what's making this thing tick. Um, and then the final bit is uh, I joined Airbus Defence and Space in 2017 on their graduate programme, which is a two-year uh, programme that lets you rotate through three different parts of the business uh, to give you the opportunity to understand uh, which sort of teams you like working with. Uh, for me, I was able to, to work in Toulouse in, in France, as well as the UK, um, understand how different working cultures are. And uh, yeah, it was a really good leveler for me, not coming into, you know, not coming from an engineering degree, but actually, uh, you know, coming from a science degree into an engineering firm. So that's my journey. Here's a little snapshot um, of that. So A-levels, yeah, through to NEMSI, then graduate scheme at Airbus. Uh, and now, having worked at Airbus for the last six years, uh, I'm a research one. I'm the research and development manager, space propulsion. Um, so across the UK, France, Germany, and Spain, which are our sites. Um, I try to coordinate all of the new technology that we're developing in the domain of space propulsion, uh, lobbying for funding of the European Space Agency uh, or UK Space Agency and the equivalents in other countries, uh, as well as trying to set what the main technology uh, gaps that we have and how can we further the field. So that was a, a rattle through of, of uh, from 10 years ago to today. Uh, and I just want to go on and play something which explains a little bit about Airbus. Uh, so it should be automated. The music's just the background.
read it off because I can't see it in the back. So exploring the universe, for example, is Gaia, uh, which is up in space at the moment, taking pictures, trying to map out to a three dimensional map of the solar system. One Web, this is a project I worked on, uh, similar to Starlink that you might see Elon Musk does, a uh, cluster of 648 satellites that all the sphere getting local space there. So uh, a lot of our sort of our devices, helicopters, and planes are used for humanitarian aid around the world. I'm sure you'll know Airbus for its planes. Uh, so they say Airbus planes take so every two and a half seconds. Strip that out of the HR um, when they go to school. I so you can probably tell I didn't put that together. <laughs> um, I, the, the reason I showed it though is because uh, it showed a few of the products uh, that we we build. Um, it's a, it's an absolutely ginormous company. Airbus. We've got one hundred and thirty thousand employees across. Uh, I think one hundred and it's one hundred and seventy countries. We have a base uh, of some sorts and one hundred and thirty nationalities. So it, it's it's really ginormous, and you get lost in in all the stuff that Airbus does. Uh, but what I can say is, you probably picked it out. But there's there's three main divisions. So we've got the commercial aircraft, which is by far the biggest uh, in terms of sales revenue, uh, in terms of people. Uh, you're probably familiar A A three eighty, the big plane, A three fifty, one of the duopolies in commercial aviation. And then we've got helicopters, and as it said on the slides, we, we're capturing two thirds of the, the helicopter market today. And then defense and space is the division I work in. So that's why I put a little box around it. And then when we go down into defense and space, of course, there's more organization. Uh, so we're split into four uh, domains. We've got connected intelligence, uh, and this is related to secure communications, um, around the world, whether that's military assets uh, and so on. We've got military aircraft, so we've got um, vehicles that can, uh, can like the uh, Eurofighter, and we're developing ECAS, which is feature air combat system for Europe, so fighter planes, as well as something like the A400M, which is a heavy lift military vehicle to, to be able to lift um, humanitarian aid into places, tanks out of places, it's, it's a big, military uh, border. Uh, one of the newest divisions is unmanned aerial systems. Uh, so this is unmanned drones. Um, this particular one here is the, the Zephyr uh, and it's currently got the record for the longest um, unaided flight, something like one or two months. But basically the, all of this top bit here is, is a solar panel um, and it's, uh, I'm pretty sure it, it's basically just got some small batteries on it and some propellers and a massive wing that probably goes the length of this building. So you can deploy small payloads um, uh, with those. And then where I work is space systems. I'm gonna obviously talk a lot more about what that involves. So within space systems, we've got, as you might be able to read, but I'll read them out, um, a few different things that we do. I'll show you a video just to kind of give you an idea of the projects, but. Uh, one area is telecommunication satellites. So this is trying to provide uh, either internet or um, or data to, to homes around the world. So I don't know if any of you guys used to have Sky TV. It's probably a bit sort of, yeah. So you, you've seen the little satellite dish at your home that's pointing up into space. The bit it's pointing to on the other end is, is more than likely an, an Airbus satellite that's able to, to beam down uh, your, yeah, your, your satellite TV. Uh, but really what we've seen is a migration into uh, a need for low cost internet um, around the world. So whether that's constellations of satellites close to Earth or ones far away, we can beam data to anywhere in the world without having to have direct line infrastructure. Um, Earth observation satellites are, are a big part of our work and um, whether that's taking images that fuel things like Google Maps uh, to, to radar images, to uh, maps that map our oceans, uh, amount of CO2. We've got a whole suite of satellites 
that are, are designed to basically monitor our planet in various ways. Um, and it's really, you know, fueling the data when you see the IPCCI reports um, uh, on climate change, uh, you, you will see that it's, it's built on data taken from space by the satellites we, we build. Navigation, um, you've probably all heard of GPS. Um, less of you would have heard of Galileo, but Galileo is the European equivalent of GPS uh, and Airbus built those satellites. Um, orbital science and exploration, which probably takes most of the headlines. Um, so here we're talking about um, the International Space Station and Airbus has built some modules on that. Uh, but also, uh, you know, whether we're landing on other planetary bodies, going back to the moon, trying to go to our deep solar system, this is all under space exploration. You'll see it a few uh, projects ongoing. Okay. Uh, and then science missions. So this covers telescopes. Um, Actually, the reason I got into to working at Airbus is because I, I learned they were doing a project called LISA, uh, which is uh, trying to understand and build a in-space gravitational wave observatory, uh, which I thought was just so cool. Uh, so I've actually been working on LISA. It's not going to be launched until 2030s, but at least I can say I designed one or two bits on that. Um, yeah, and then uh, really to say that Airbus part owns Ariane Group, who do all of the European rockets that launch from that. So let me try it. So this should show a few of the products um, working with. Juice, so this was going to the icy moons around Jupiter. This is the ExoMars rover. This is built this in Stevenage in our office here. So it's a rover to try and dig two meters underground. It's got a chemistry lab on board to analyze samples underneath the Martian surface. International Space Station, the Bartholomew module was built by, by Airbus. Um, you might see NASA's going back to the moon on Artemis. The vehicle that takes them there, the propulsion, the uh, life support is all built by, by us. So our constellation of weather. Part find the mission to try and prove that the, the LISA, the gravitational wave observatory, would work. And now we're getting onto our Earth observation. Okay, so that was trying to rattle through about Airbus. Apologies, it was a bit mechanical. Um, it's easier, they've got a lot of marketing to show, show what they're doing. Um, now is where I'm going to talk a little bit about more what I do. I feel more comfortable talking about my own work rather than all of the other stuff. Um, so 
as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I work in research and development in space propulsion. Uh, and probably the first thing to distinguish that I didn't realize before is that space propulsion is different to launch ship propulsion. So typically what you would have is a rocket that is launching into space that would release all of those satellites that you see, whether they've got humans on board or not, so satellites or spacecraft. And then when you're in space, you need, also need a propulsion system. Um, but I, I don't know if anyone can maybe volunteer why we might need that propulsion system when we're in space. What, what sort of things can we do? Anyone got any ideas? Yeah, exactly. So what, why um, propulsion is the system by which we move around in space. But I'm just asking what's what sort of why would we want to move in space and where might, why, might we want to move to, basically? Or collisions with other space items. Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of debris in space. There's a lot of uh, congestion, particularly when we're very close to the Earth. So we might want to do collision and avoidance to move out of the way uh, of, a, of another satellite or debris. <laughs> Very important. So if, we, if we're if we orbiting around the Earth and we've got a camera that's meant to be taking pictures of the Earth and we can't control how we're pointing, not very good. So we, we can use propulsion to do that coarse pointing and then we, we maybe do finer pointing with mechanisms on the actual uh, telescope that we're, we're using. Exactly. Any other? Yeah, at the back. Exactly. So we, yeah. So we we've got to we've got to make sure. Um, we always think of space as sort of flat, but if you if you've seen any of those diagrams that show uh, sort of gravitational wells where you've got the sun. The, the, the fabric of space-time isn't flat and we, we end up orbiting around things uh, and it's actually very difficult if we've got big masses such as the earth close to us or the sun close to that to not fall into it so we need to be able to navigate finally through that uh, that complex uh, yeah, set of space-time to allow us to actually arrive at the right place at the right time whether that's staying out of falling back down to earth or getting to another planet. Okay, so very good. Is any more? No, I'll go. I'll go through. So, if we focus on the the exploration side, um, we start off when we get to Earth, and uh, when we're sorry, when we're launching from Earth, uh, we need to be able to uh, get ourselves to another planet. Now, um, this can be actually much more challenging than we think. If we zoom off really fast to another planet, and we've got a lot of momentum, uh, we will go out of its gravitational well and carry on. So one of the most important bits where we use propulsion is, is the transfer to different planets, but also the planetary ins insertion, where when we get to Mars, we slow ourselves down very quickly so that we can be captured in its gravitational well. We've got landing on another planet. So you've seen NASA do this uh, maybe a, a, year, a year or two ago, be able to land on, on Mars. We also are looking at ways of being able to, to take off again from those planets. Uh, so if we've got humans there, we don't want to just leave them there. We need to bring them back. Uh, we've also got a mission with Mars sample return. We've got to get samples back. So we've got to have ways of propelling ourselves off our un other planetary bodies. Um, we've got orbit raising. So when we get injected into space, we might not be in the right orbit. So we might want to raise up to a higher orbit. A good example of that would be um, geostationary satellites. So I talked about Sky TV. We want to make sure that if our satellite dish is pointing at uh, the satellite in space, that they're not moving relative to each other. So if we put the satellite 36,000 kilometers away, the angular velocity of that satellite is the same as the satellite dish on the Earth. And so it will stay fundamentally in our eyes in the same position. So we might want to raise our orbit to get to 36,000 kilometers away. We might want to, once we've used, finished up with our satellite and no longer use it, rather than just leaving it space junk, we might want to deorbit it back into Earth 
so that it burns up in the atmosphere. Or we might, if we're really far away, push it further away so it's not in the way of active satellites. So that's some other reasons why we might use space propulsion. And then a few more which we picked up on already. So attitude control, trying to make sure that we're focusing uh, and pointing our satellite in the direction we want it to. Rendezvous. So if we're docking with the International Space Station, we need to have fine control so that we don't crash into it and break it. And then collision avoidance, we've already mentioned. So these are all different <laughs> ways why uh, the team I work in might build a propulsion system. And they have different sort of requirements that come down, which is really interesting for us because it completely changes how we design that satellite. So uh, you could spend months uh, learning how to do rocket propulsion. Uh, I thought I'd start with a balloon. Uh, I think if you imagine you've blown up your balloon. Yeah, so you've got your balloon here, you haven't tied it. We let go. Of course, we know what's going to happen if our balloon is going to fly away. But if we actually think and analyse that a little bit, what's actually happening? Well, the pressure and the, the elasticity of the, the balloon is, is, is applying pressure on the, the air inside our balloon and expelling it out the back of our balloon. And we know from Newton's third law that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, or force equals the mass of gas times the acceleration of that gas. Yeah, F equals MA. We're back to, back to school again, I think. Um, but what we can do is we can take that F equals MA. If you think of acceleration as just velocity per second, we can rearrange the equation and rather than having mass times acceleration, we can rearrange it to say thrust is equal to velocity times the mass per second. So you, you might never dot above it means mass per second. It's the same equation, but we're just rearranging it into some, some more useful terms to us. So what we have there, the VE is the exit velocity of the gas out of the balloon. And the m dot is equivalent to the mass flow rate, how much mass is coming out per second. <clears throat> and what's quite interesting to know is if we say keep our thrust fixed, so keep keep this as a constant, f, yeah, and we increase the velocity that gas uh, exits our, our balloon. What must happen to, to the mass flow rate in order to make sure that the force is the same? Let's go down. So if we double our exit velocity, our mass flow rate for the same force must go down. And that's quite, quite intuitive, because if you think what mass flow rate really is for a spacecraft, is it's its fuel efficiency. If, a, if, there's, if we're getting the same amount of force, but the flow rate of gas out is going down, then we're becoming more fuel efficient. So what we learn, which is quite fundamental with a lot of the research and development that I do, is that the exit velocity of your gas out of the balloon is directly proportional to the fuel efficiency of your spacecraft. Now, fuel efficiency is so important to us because it's very rare that once we've launched something into space for up to 15 years, maybe 21 years, that we get the opportunity to refill it. So we really want to maximize that value so that we, we can do the most amount of propulsing all of those maneuvers for the least amount of fuel. With me so far? I was, I was losing myself, so I'm barely got it. Um, so how do we do that? There's lots of ways, and I can't spend time going through all of them, but the two main groups that we, we use are a group called chemical propulsion, and a group called electric propulsion. These are two types of systems that we, we build in space propulsion systems. Um, chemical propulsion, pro you can probably guess what that is. It looks a bit more like a normal rocket. We've got a fuel, we've got an oxidizer. We've got an oxidizer because we can't rely on the air because there's no air in space. Yep. So we've got fuel and oxidizer, and we are bringing them together in an exothermic chemical reaction to heat up gases that, just like your balloon, get expelled out of space. 
In electric propulsion, this is a bit more nuanced. And we can't do it on Earth because the thrust we get from this is so low. But we can do it in space because when we have microgravity, even if you're thrusting, you know, just like blowing yeah. air, that sort of very low force, we can still over time do a lot and, and accelerate to really fast speeds. So electric propulsion, uh, and particularly solar electric propulsion, is where we're taking energy from the sun, it's radiated down and captured by our spacecraft solar arrays. Yeah, so we're now generating electricity. And then that electricity can be used to first ionize um, a propellant, so turn it, you know, strip off an electron and turn it into an ion. And then those ions can be accelerated through an electromagnetic field to extremely, extremely high velocities out the back of our spacecraft. Okay, so this is this is another field we work on called electric propulsion. And the great advantage of that is it's super fuel efficient. So low thrust, fuel efficient, high thrust, less fuel efficient. And just below here, here you can see just a photo. So that's a chemical propulsion thruster at the bottom where we are just taking the fuel and oxidizer together. And here is the uh, is a plasma thruster, an electric propulsion plasma. So this, this blue line here is a xenon that's been uh, turned into a plasma and ejected out. It's sort of a bluey. Um, <coughs> And this might be a bit small for you to see, but down at the bottom, what I've put in is a very simplified version of the equation. Because I said to you earlier, we want to maximize our fuel efficiency. So I'm just saying, how does fuel efficiency relate to key terms in the uh, equation? So what we find for a chemical system, the hotter the reaction, the higher the, the reaction temperature, the higher we can, the faster we can expel those gases out. So in chemical propulsion, we're trying to get those reactions as hot as possible to get the best fuel efficiency. And in electric propulsion, because we rely on the, um, we, we ionize them and we rely on the strength of the electromagnetic field, we want to get that electromagnetic field as high as possible. So if we increase the voltage we're of, of, a, of a solenoid, we're able to create really high um, electromagnetic field gradients which we can then use to accelerate our, our ionized gases out the back. What we also know is that if we decrease the mass of our um, of the particles that we're accelerating out, because they are uh, less, they well, they're lighter, uh, we can accelerate them under the same electromagnetic field faster. So what we find is for electric propulsion, if you increase the voltage that you're supplying and you decrease this, the, the molecular mass of the iron, the ISP or the fuel efficiency increases. Okay. So why do we need chemical prop? I, I've said this before that uh, shown you this slide. Well, we'd like to be as fuel efficient, so why don't we always use electric? We don't always use electric propulsion because for some maneuvers, we don't get the thrust. So for taking off, landing, doing quick collision avoidance maneuvers or deorbiting, we need really, really high thrust. And so electric propulsion today is out of the window. We just don't have enough power to get the, the um, force. And I just wanted to <laughs> link this to, to chemistry a little bit. So uh, put up very, some, uh, just a quick video of what we're using today. So what I want to focus on is uh, a few things. First is to say, in the top right, a lot of my job and the team that I work in's job is to design systems that don't break for 25 years. So uh, we've got to be able to keep a propellant not decomposing. We've got to stop it reacting with all the materials it's touching. We've got to make sure that all of the valves that take the propellant on these lines to the, to the engine are working and design them such that if one part breaks, we've got a backup routing. We do a lot of analysis on this to say, okay, if the propellant we're storing heats up and cools down, how it's gonna behave? What are the, the pressures gonna be like in the system? 
So most of my work is, is trying to design these systems. And we rely on the fundamental chemistry uh, of reacting common propellants. Now, one of the most common blends that we use today uh, is monomethyl hydrazine, that's the fuel, so in the red at the top, uh, and nitrogen tetroxide as the oxidizer. Um, and why they're so good for us is because of the specificities of space. The first thing is we need something that's super reliable. So when we take nitrogen tetroxide and um, MMH, monomethyl hydrazine, and we just put them in contact with each other at room temperature, they spontaneously react exothermically, very, very exothermically. And so we call these hypoglolic fuels. And why they're so good is because we don't need a spark, we don't need a really high preheat to get those uh, molecules to react. And that's good because it means better reliability in space. All we have to do is... Yeah, here, just here. Um, we just have to, in the engine, make sure that they're mixing really well. The downside, obviously, is that if they do come into contact when you don't want, you've basically got a bomb. So we have to really put a lot of safety regulations uh, to make sure that when we filled these up, that the systems don't leak, that the pipework for the fuel and the oxidizer are separated as much as possible up until the engine. Um, but when it, when it does go, we get a really exothermic reaction. And as I said to you before, if it's exothermic, it's getting hot, then the efficiency is as good as we can get. Um, the other important parameters are that these propellants are storable at room temperature, and that makes a huge difference for us. So you might have seen um, SpaceX launch or uh, NASA launch in the past, and you can see all these sort of bellows of what looks like smoke coming off the rocket. Well, what that is, is that's because the propellants they use are cryogenic. So they've cooled them down at, at room temperature, there'd be gases. So liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen is what uh, NASA is using on their big rockets. And they have to cool them down to 20 Kelvin for liquid hydrogen. And uh, I, I can't remember what the liquid oxygen temperature is, which is fine if you've got to keep it at that temperature for for 20 minutes, half an hour that you're you're launching into space. But if you've got to keep it for 25 years, it's very hard. <laughs> so the reason we choose these propellants is because they're storable at room temperature um, and they're dense. Densities uh, a key commodity because we can only fit so much propellant in a rocket. We want it to be as light as possible, the propellant, but also it's compact so we can fit all of our payload on board. And the final point is we can vary the thrust of these engines a lot, from 10 newtons for doing little attitude control, up to 27 kilonewtons, which is the main engine on the um, Orion capsule that we're building uh, that will take uh, humans back to their, their orbit around the moon where they'll, they'll do their first look. So that's chemical propulsion. Uh, and then now we switch over to electric propulsion. And for all of these maneuvers highlighted here, the key driver is not for us. We can take a long time to do them. We can take six months to get from our injection into space into 36,000 kilometers away where the um, telecommunication satellites are. We don't mind taking so long. Uh, but what we really want to do is do it very efficiently so that we create a lot more space for our payload. And by payload, talking about transponders, for cameras, all of the stuff that the customer's paying for. So there's a, a, a strong drive to, to focus that. I'm gonna try my best with animations to show uh, the, the bizarre art of uh, an electric propulsion thruster. There's lots of different types. This one is uh, relying on what's called ball effect thruster. It relies on the ball effect principle. I don't know if that's more physics and chemistry. Um, and before we get on, I'm just going to start with familiar ground in case you get lost. So this is what I showed you before. This is a working ball effect thruster uh, spewing out xenon. In our key here, so we have xenon is the light blue. You'll see dark blue is ionized xenon. So we've stripped an electron on off and we've got xenon plus, which is now able to be accelerated. And then red is the electrons. 
And then this quite bad diagram that I've done here is meant to simulate a fall of bed cross, which this has been cut in half and probably a bit blurry on the screen. But the main elements that you have, you can see, is you've got an electromagnet on the outside. So this is this electromagnet there. You've got an electromagnet running through the middle, the permanent magnet. You've got a cathode. The cathode here is, is generating electrons. And I think that's all you probably need to know. When we power up this Hall effect thruster, we're getting, you can see here, voltage, so 300 volts. We're getting an electric field gradient. And this is going to accelerate our, our xenon alpha system. So I'm going to try and explain it. We might have to go through once or twice. But what we're doing is we're, we're donating electrons from the cathode. We're getting caught in this electromagnetic field gradient. And we're now going to push xenon so slowly out of our thruster. And when it hits an electron, it will ionize it, generating an extra electron. And this process will then kind of keep going in a cascade will generate more and more electrons, which will then start to um, create, I guess, a sort of cascading effect where we've got a big, um, we've got a big area, of, a big density of trapped electrons at high, um, high energy, which when the xenon is coming in, is ionizing them, and then they're getting accelerated up to 20,000 um, meters per second out of your spacecraft, giving you the thrust. So I'll try and show that again. I don't know, was it, could you see it again? Yeah. Again, so we've got the electrons donated by the cathode, trapped in the magnetic field gradient. They will start to ionize the xenon that's coming in, and it will generate more electrons, which will get trapped in the electric field. And this will then be a continuous process, ionizing and accelerating out our um, xenon electrons. So sort of when we have a steady state, we have this, we've got a, a high density of electrons in here. We've got your propellant feeding system giving the xenon up here, ionization, and then you've got xenon ions being accelerated out. Might be missing something, but yeah. Don't end up with a massive negative charge on the spacecraft, especially in this. So that's part of the role of this, a very good question. It's part of the role of the cathode. So if I show you here. So as we accelerate our xenon ions out, because we've got a, a looser field of electrons outside, you'll see that the there's a recombination of the xenon uh, plus with the electrons, which gives charge and neutrality. Because otherwise, you you would eventually just create a massive uh, negative charge. So do you see? Yeah, <laughs> it's meant to be that it's coming up. So yes. So it's so. Good. Chem this is definitely chemistry, purely table. So wh why why is xenon a good electric propulsion propellant? Um, well, what do we need? Firstly, we want to look at uh, the noble gases. We've started to look at the noble gases. Um, two reasons, three reasons. First one is that they're inert. So that's really good for our spacecraft design. It means that they're not going to be very reactive with all the pipe work that we've got inside. They're not going to cause us too much trouble. Uh, and also then monatomic, which is really good because what we don't want, when I showed you that process of high energy electrons, if we've got uh, molecules, there's a chance that rather than ionizing our, um, our xenon, if it was something, let's say we tried it with water before, we, we find a lot of the energy goes into dissociation, which then means the efficiency, the power efficiency of our engines really poor. So inert monatomics are good. It's in the name, noble gases. Gases are also great because we don't have to put energy in to vaporize uh, a, a liquid or solid um, into a gas before we do this process of ionization. So it's one job already done for us. And actually, the problem for electric propulsion isn't the efficiency. I told you, as we 
uh, we want to improve efficiency. But what we find is that as we keep increasing our efficiency, um, our thrust goes lower and lower. It's, it's, they're sort of balanced together. So what we find is for chemical propulsion, we want to maximize our efficiency. For electric propulsion, we want to be efficient, but still retain some of the thrust so we get to places in good time. So actually, as we go down this group, the, the, uh, the ions that we're creating get heavier and heavier. And what we find is xenon is a heavy ion that gives us a good balance of thrust and efficiency. If we did the same with helium, we'd get much higher fuel efficiency, but we'd never get anywhere. Um, so xenon is a good option. What, why don't we go to radon? Anyone got any ideas? <laughs> yeah, it's not stable. It's radioactive. So in terms of where we are on the periodic table, xenon is a, a good place to be. Um, and then, then the other bit we want to look at is, uh, I talk, talked about ionization. So this is the first ionization energy uh, across the periodic table. I've just picked out the noble gases. Uh, an interesting point is that as we go down the, uh, the groups, we find that the first ionization energy of uh, xenon is, is lower than, than the others. Um, and so that's a, a benefit because it means we have to put less energy in to ionizing the xenon. Um, someone here could probably tell me why. I guess it's that shielded electrons uh, and it's weaker interactions, but it's been a long time since it's done. Good. But that's not the full story. Um, there's a few things that you need to know about xenon. The first is that there's only 70 tons of it made globally per year. Just to give you a, a view, one of our spacecraft that we build takes up one ton. So what we find is that the amount of xenon that's needed for the space industry is huge. And today it's about 30% of global supply goes into supplying spacecraft. If we included all of uh, Elon Musk's uh, uh, Starlinks, we wouldn't have enough xenon, which is maybe why he's looked elsewhere. So the point is, is that it's a very rare, um, rare gas. We have to cool down the air uh, and take out 0 0.08 parts per million, uh, which is in the air all around us, in order to extract it, and we need to then purify. So it's an expensive gas because of this uh, rarity and and fact that we have to put a lot of energy in to, to get the xenon out. Um, what made matters worse a couple of years ago is uh, about 30 to 40% of the rare gas supply in the world comes out of Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this is a photo of the steel making plant at Mariupol, uh, which you might, might see in the news as one of the key battlegrounds um, in the war in Ukraine, or still is. Um, and what this, this liquefaction process always takes place at steel making plants. Uh, so it's really just to say that we lost about 30 to 40 percent of global supply, which has added a lot of price instability into to the zone. Um, and it, you know, it can be up to tens of thousands per kilo. So if you're putting a ton in, you know, you're talking millions. Um, what's that forced us to do? It's, it's forced us to, to look at our periodic table and say, where else can we go? So a good option is Krypton. Starlink uses that today because they need large volumes. We obviously know there's negative sides. Um, the storage density of Krypton's about is good, so we have to go to very high pressures to store it. Um, the ionization is a little bit worse, so we get worse performance. But the good thing is there's more abundance, so we're getting a lot more of the krypton and the price is cheap. So that's one way where my team are looking to, to develop new technologies. Uh, and the other is iodine. What we find is the ionization of iodine is, is very good. It's got very low ionization energy, um, so that's good news. Uh, we find that because it's quite a big molecule, that the thrust is quite good and the efficiencies are all, all quite good. Uh, one of the main challenges here is that you may know that iodine, as you can see here, at room temperature and pressure is a solid. Now, that doesn't work too well if you want to put it in an engine. So a lot of the work here is going on to how do we design systems that are uh, have material compatibility with iodine. Um, water doesn't like iodine. Aluminium is not a big fan. Um, and how do we then feed that into the engines like I showed you? Uh, 
And then now if we look at, I showed you earlier, chemical propulsion. Um, I told you lots of good stuff about uh, monomethyl hydrazine, but one of the main issues is it's, because it's very energetic, you would expect it's very corrosive. Uh, it's, it's flammable in air. Uh, it can, when you've got, if you've got any rust around, it can spontaneously combust. Uh, the, these are the escape suits that our team use to load it because if it touches you, it's lethal, uh, it can kill you. Uh, so you have to wear these very expensive equipment to, to load our spacecraft. And once it's loaded, we can't let anyone nearby. Uh, and what that does is when we do a sort of a cost analysis, we find about 20% of the overall cost of building our propulsion system goes into all of the extra stuff we have to do because of this dangerous chemical. So it's a significant chunk. Um, so a lot of the research that I work on is, is something called green propellants. Uh, and really they're not very green, they're still nasty chemicals, but they're not as nasty as hydrazine. So what do we want from a green propellant? We want it not to be on the, the REACH list of banned substances. Um, who, who's familiar with REACH? Yeah. REACH, uh, you may be able to explain better than me. I, all I know is that they're trying to ban the hydrazine. <laughs> it's not good for us. Yeah. So they're they're trying to sort of wean us off hydrazine. Um uh, it's because it's dangerous and they don't think it is. so we need to investigate in new areas. Um we don't want to be using these scape suits, these oxygen fed breathing equipment, uh, and we want to be able to load a spacecraft and then be able to do loads of other tests on it afterwards. So we could maybe load it before we get to some of these launch sites that can be uh, all around the world. Uh, so there's lots of ways we can do that, but just to say what, one area where you see a bit of promise is, is in what's called water propulsion. Um, very simply, rather than storing a nasty propellant, you store water. ASTM type 2 water, you could drink it, you'd be fine. Uh, but on board your spacecraft, what you put on is, is an electrolyzer. Um, there's different electrolyzer designs, but um, cathode fed um, proton exchange membranes are probably the, the best. And what they do is they electrolyze, they take power from the spacecraft um, and they electrolyze the water into hydrogen and oxygen gas, which we know are very good propellants actually some of the best uh, in terms of performance. We store them at high pressure in a gaseous form and we feed them into our, our thrusters. So this is one of the ways we're trying to get around storing something nice like water but still getting performance for spacecraft. Yeah, so that sort of concludes a uh, whistle stop tour of space propulsion. Um, to do a two more HRE slides, but see if people ask HRE type stuff. Uh, yeah, any any questions? Can be on that. Roughly, what is the cost of the time? Yeah, uh, it's I, I can say it's it will range between two and fifteen thousand a kilo. So yeah, times five thousand. So you're, you're two and fifteen thousand million. Uh, two hundred two and fifteen million. So when you uh, when you big get space to, to your subjects to load, it's going to be in what one ton per time or dry or uh yeah. So we've got big. Uh, I mean, uh, the big sort of gas companies have, have the equipment that they can bring on site to be able to load in duration. Yeah. Um, depends on your spacecraft. If you're doing a smaller mission. Load no, much much smaller amounts. But why does that still make it? Sorry. Why is it so shaky to still make it? Yeah. So um, essentially, steel needs nitrogen and oxygen to be made, wow. uh, and the process they do that is liquefaction of air. So they take out you never know, nitrogen so oxygen. It's a byproduct of that, and only the biggest plants around the world are making enough. You know byproduct of xenon to then distill, yeah. distill, distill. I mean, you get a sort of millionth of the, yeah. the oxygen and it's uh, extremely energy intensive. Yeah. 
When you uh, <coughs> use that is so tie two iodine um, mm -hmm. as a uh, uh, kind of potential, does it uh, form just a single iron or, or does it form an array of iron? As in, when it's being, uh, as in, does it dissociate yeah. into different? Um, if I'm honest, I want it, I yeah, exactly. So there's a potential for dissociation. I think there will be a certain fraction. Um, I would have to check. Uh, we we have something called an E cross B probe that will tell us uh, the composition at, at the end. Um, what it what effectively it will come down to is whether the first ionization energy is similar to the dissociation energy of that um, yeah that that I bond um, or not, and I, I don't know that. And when it's in use, do you just depend upon natural uh, sublimation or do you, do you have a more controlled process? Uh, it needs to be more controlled. So those engines I showed you there are very sensitive to flow rate in. Uh, and so you, if you put too much uh, propellant at one time, you, you can collapse the plasma. So you need to actually have, um, you know, be, be heating up above 80 degrees, 1900, depending on your pressure that you're operating at. Uh, and it's, yeah, obviously it's a huge challenge um, to make sure that if you've got something so hot there that the, uh, let's say the cryo cooler that you've got next door to it is uh, is uh, kept cold. So um, we go through some interesting development cycles at the moment. Not an ideal candidate. One of, the, one of the interesting things is that it's extremely compact because it's a solid. And uh, you can keep that low pressure. So when you're going to Xenon, Krypton, uh, the pressures you're having to get to to get any sort of good storage density are extremely high. That uh, has a lot of negative effects. So you know you, we can't find the perfect propellant. One's expensive. One's very high pressure. Uh, one is uh, a bit nasty to work with. So uh, what I would say is, depending on the mission, um, we will see different applications emerge. So I, I worked with uh, xenon modernization donors and process from Van Parsak and Mombard. Mm -hmm. It's quite ionizing cell against things. Is there a corrosion problem? Yeah. Corrosion. Yeah, basically. And um more so in the actual in the anode. So where we're accelerating, you know, up to twenty thousand uh, meters per second. Yeah, you, that, that's one of the main mechanisms for an engine failure, is erosion. So uh, you, newer engines are starting to use what's called magnetic confinement to basically shield the walls from it, but your ceramics that you use are, are just eroding away over time. And one of the thoughts is, is with something like Krypton, because it's slightly lighter, you're going to get to higher velocities, whether that is going to increase erosion. So, yeah, it's, it's whether the, you know, the momentum should be same, but it's, it's whether that's more penetrating or not through the magnetic field. Um, so the momentum is the same, so you can get any energy to sure. the velocity. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, it's v squared. Yeah, so, so it's a momentum line. So. Mm. Okay. Something else, is it worth considering making a plasma through combustion? So you've got, you don't have negative charges or electrons. If you burn sodium, something. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So you generate sodium ions and electrons. Shoot the sodium ions out. Um, we, I mean, so sodium, lithium, I mean, they've been looked at um, it, as chemical components because because they're quite quite reactive. Um, uh, and I think if I remember correctly, one of the main issues is that. Lot, with a lot of spacecraft, you you know some of our spacecraft we built ten years ago and they're just launching now because the the uh, clever dogs at a university haven't developed the camera that we need on board. So uh, long term storage could be an issue, and how do you maintain them in the atmosphere? Um, I, I'm I'm sure that people have looked at that. Um, what we try and do at Airbus is take the the technologies that are maturing to a stage that we can integrate them into our spacecraft. So you know there'll be a company that builds the thrusters. Be a company that builds these parts and we integrate them together and understand the system. Um, and uh, we wait till we get a bit more Yeah, I heard that there was a failure on the jet of the state, space telescope. 
not even real and I'm getting all the And of course, it was 10 years old by the time it was launched. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much the case. Some of your passion was decent for the last maybe 25 years. Mm. I've got an idea that it's lasted 25 years before it's broken down. So, yeah. is it, does it come down to the design or the uh, assembly unit? Or what's yeah. quite sure is that the idea? Um, yeah, so I mean, we, we design our spacecraft for 16 years, uh, the, the one, the geostationary ones. Uh, typically, what we found is that they've lasted 21 to 25 years. So, Airbus are known of over designing our equipment. Um, how we do that? It, at least in propulsion, is we, we have um, trying to eliminate single point failures. So, like the easiest way to think of it is um, if you are uh, if you're trying to pipe your tank to your thruster, um, every time you've got a valve, you know you've got to think that valve might fail closed, and that would end your system. So you might have to have a second routing alongside it um, to to allow so be redundancy. redundancy everywhere. Yeah. Um, so we've asked for one. So that's for one of its yeah, completely. Weight to cost. Um we add a lot of acceptance testing. So we don't just buy components here, we we add our own testing, which you know, valves can cost um rather than hundred pounds can cost ten thousand up to hundred thousand in some cases, because of all the individual testing we do on the component before we accept it. Right. Um so it's, it's it's a lot of that. We're self-regulating. So a lot of the um knowledge is in-house we know how things fail and we try and understand it very well so that if we get that failure mechanism we can design it out another so do you stress the things the yeah so proof pressure testing so we take it up to uh 1.5 times its operating pressure we cycle it to temperatures um maximum and minimum which not for propulsion but for other equipment can be minus 180 up to 180 um, we do vibration to simulate the launch environment, put it in a vacuum, uh, we do performance testing on individual parts. So everything we know, we've got a lot of data on, um, and which helps to on the reliability. When you're building a constellation of like 600 satellites, you probably don't care if one fails as much, so you can lower those requirements a bit. You would before the talk about the deeper balance for the space bar clusters. Yeah. Tell me why. Uh, yeah, so the main candidates, so water propulsion, I've talked about. Um, we've got ADNs, which are, um, they are sort of ionic liquids that are, are reacted. Um, they, <coughs> the main issue today is that it's a monopoly of one, we can only buy it from one person, so we no one needs to really be tied in to that. Um, Hydrogen peroxide, I mean, if you look back to sort of the dawn of rocketry, uh, that was what the V2 and other bits were starting to use was hydrogen peroxide. Uh, trouble with that is it decomposes over time. Uh, so we don't think we can use it longer than five years in space before it starts to decompose. Now, if you've got a 15 year mission, that's quite hard. Um, it also pressurizes, so it decomposes into oxygen and then the pressure of the tanks go up. So you have to have a mechanism to vent space um, then there's there's nitrous oxide you know, laughing gas um, reacting that with, with propane Th those are sort of the common ones that are being looked at as candidates yeah so so the um is that the new process because it seems like quite a heavy system to have to have something remaining in the thrust yeah, so those are for the thrusters when you're in space. So when you're on the ground, fine to liquefy it for the rocket and go up. Uh, one of the main issues is that gaseous hydrogen and gaseous oxygen aren't very dense. So if you're generating that, you couldn't do a really long burn. Let's say you're trying to get captured into Martian atmosphere um, and you're going really fast. You've got to do a long, continuous firing to slow yourself down. And there you wouldn't be able to take the water and generate the hydrogen and oxygen quick enough to do the firing. So you are somewhat limited by the size of the maneuver, not the thrust. You could do a really high thrust for one second or, you know, ease off. But... Also, um, I was reading about the 
uh, in the 60s. There was, there was a lot of, um, they're very excited about using uh, um, red cream and nitric acid mm -hmm. as an oxidant. Is that still around at all? Uh, yeah, I mean, nitric acid's been used. Um, what we, uh, we we haven't used it so much ourselves. Um, all of these combinations of propellants, annoyingly, are very energetic, but come with, come with the same challenges of you don't want to get it on you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's different. Blend. Russia, you know, they've got different blends for the same thing. Do we have any more questions? Uh, uh, just a couple of comments, really. Um, <clears throat> one of them was that um, when you did um, your year of teaching between school and Bath, was that with VSO? And if so, was it a pleasant experience? Did you have know, people you wanted to learn or anything? Uh, it was similar to VSO. It's called Project Trials, uh, where they specifically take 18 to uh, 21 year olds. And, and, but you have to spend yeah, at least a year somewhere. Uh, really, yeah, one of the best years of my life. Um, yeah, we were in the edge of the Amazon rainforest, so you'd go uh, you know, hunting, burn arrows, uh, fun, riding bulls in the savannas. Uh, yeah, very different lifestyle. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed my time. And people did, people did want to learn. I found it very hard to teach about skyscrapers and geography because the, the idea of a CBD central business district and tall buildings isn't really a thing but you could take people out into the rivers and show them how a meander worked and uh, yeah there was some interest in that sort of more nature connected area. It was actually quite very quickly, uh, anecdotally as much as anything else, but the you mentioned uh, in passing about the building well, there was, um, I don't know if it's still available. I had a community <coughs> for some years, but the own university uh, had a very good uh, program in Spain, which incorporated German uh, teaching material yeah. from the Second World War wow. uh, and um, brought it back and white with the original. Right <laughs> the and so it occurs to me, I must have a look to see if someone put it on YouTube. So I lost the DVD. Uh, which is because they don't uh, it's copyright material. Mm -hmm. So if you get in touch with the other university, you're going to be able to find it. Yeah, C stop and P stop. No, but I mean, it, a lot of the same designs from back then you know, made it through, and a lot of chemical propulsion hasn't changed much. Electric propulsion is only really become feasible. Um, yeah, yeah, a bit of C Probably rocket science, if I'm yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's what really fueled, fueled NASA is, is the designs emerging out of the gym. Do we have a big amount of pods for Sam or something? Um, yeah, thanks. And I like, should say, uh, uh it's, jobs there <laughs> so i mean yeah airbus we're, we're hiring the whole time um if you're interested you know coming from chemistry background you sh shouldn't feel excluded we've got material sciences teams propulsion teams thermal teams who all can rely on the skills that you're building in, in learning about in chemistry physical chemistry or material science so um yeah if you, if you like what what we do please please apply Thank you.